This is MJ. I love Tokusatsu, and right now, I want to talk to you about why you should be watching Kamen Rider Zero One. At the time of this recording, Kamen Rider Zero One is having an off week because of a relay race or something like that in Japan, um, and the ninth episode has aired. Uh, up, well, the first two nine episodes have aired, and I thought it would be a good time to kind of pause and... Uh, think about the show so far and uh, kind of given a little bit of an assessment and uh, after doing so I realized that people who aren't watching uh, should jump on soon uh, which is why I decided to make this so I'm going to start very much in a non in non-spoiler territory and then I will give you uh, plenty of opportunity to jump off when I start to talk about spoilers so I'm going to say for my my my, my spoiler free uh, reasons to watch the show are very simple. They are aesthetics, action, and execution. So, the suits in the show are uh, one, there are plenty. Two, they're very interesting. Um, I'll be slightly spoilery and say we're in the very beginning. Uh, we're introduced to two different types of belts or henchin devices. Uh, one of them belongs to the main writer, Zero One, and the uh, other belongs to a uh, different set of writers, or, or there are multiples of this uh, henchin device. And uh, they all use these uh, progress keys, which look like, they, to me, they look like cassette tapes. I, I wonder how much they're supposed to look like cassette tapes, but um, they're uh, kind of like, I actually have, I have a Jetta, and it has a, a key fob where you press a little thing on it, and the blade of the key... Uh, pops out and the progress keys do something similar and then they're uh, you know inserted into the henchin device and that activates either the henchin itself or a weapon or whatever um, you know, as common writer modern common writer is uh, want to do to uh, you know stick a toy inside of another toy or a collectible toy into like a weapon or, or something like that so they go ahead and do that here uh, but the result is pretty interesting suits um, Again, I'm, I'm trying to be very light on spoilers. Uh, the variety of the uh, suits between Zero One and the Ames writers, I'll call them, uh, is very interesting. Uh, they have very, very distinct looks, and the way that they look um, kind of means different things. Or, or uh, it's, it's a great bit of visual storytelling because uh, it shows that they represent different things and... Um, Gosh, even the way they do form changes is so different that it makes it feel like they're distinct and like they were developed for distinct purposes by distinct people, um, which I think is really interesting. I, I think it makes it more interesting and, and richer. It doesn't look like everything came from the same toy line, uh, and it adds a dimension of um, of realism to it, I guess you could say, which maybe uh, is part of the execution. Uh, so I'll, I'll move on to the action. Um Oh, well, one more thing I guess I, I need to say is that the uh, villains, the Humagir that they fight, or the Magir, the villainous Magir that they fight, uh, the, you know, there's like the standard ones, and then there's the more advanced ones that are, you know, the focus, the bigger enemy that they have to fight versus the mooks, so to speak. And uh, I think both look great. Uh, it's very simple, um, the way that the mooks look versus the way the... Uh, you know, more advanced versions look, uh, but it makes a lot of sense, and it's very cool, very sleek. Uh, if you like Showa stuff at all, I think it'll be very pleasing to you. Uh, this is the Reiwa era of Kamen Rider, and I'm not sure 100% how they've chosen to distinguish themselves from uh, previous eras. Uh, it feels a little bit more like a pastiche of of <laughs> Heisei, um, whether that be uh, post decade Heisei and... Uh, well, no, it kind of feels like an interesting combination of all, uh, both Heisei eras and uh, the Showa era. But anyway, I uh, won't get into that right now. Um, the action is really interesting. Uh, there's heavy use of um, CGI for the finishers and this on-screen text thing, which is interesting to me. Uh, but besides that, uh, or, and that's a little bit of a distraction, uh, but what I like more is the actual fights. Uh, they are very energetic. The camera is more dynamic, and um, yeah, I, I think I think that about sums up uh, how good the action is. And and 
uh, w- with one other caveat that's you know slightly edging into spoilers, um, the villains of the series uh, do a lot of interesting stuff with their action. Um, I guess that's all I have to say for now. Uh, so those are my uh, non-spoilery thoughts on why you should be watching uh, Kamen Rider Zero One. Uh, basically, it's quality. It's quality craftsmanship. Uh, it's a good-looking show. Um, the action is exciting to watch uh, and, in- and very engaging. And um, just the way the story is being handled is very interesting to see. Um, some of it feels like a little bit, a little bit of a slow burn. Like uh, it, it might be a little frustrating to see things happen in you know episode one, but they're kind of addressed in episode two, and then something in two will come up, and then it's addressed in episode three or four, um, which I I think is very pleasing. It's some good pacing. All right, spoilers are inbound, so jump off now if you don't want to hear anything. Uh, I'll say something non-spoilery. Uh, the um, the opening song is really good. Uh, I like it a lot. It has a lot of good energy and uh, it's a lot of fun. Although it is funny that it just has in the beginning zero one zero one zero one zero one zero one. Uh, it's just kind of funny. Um, a little silly. <laughs> anyway, so I hope you're gone by now. If you didn't want any spoilers, um, but if you're checking out the video version of this year, probably seeing uh, I guess some spoilers on the screen right now in the form of some different suits uh, other than zero ones. So. Sorry, if, uh, if it's too late, it's too late. And um, Anyway, I still haven't said anything, so you, you can still jump away now. Here we go. Uh, so, talking about the suits, the stunts, the depth, and the nuance. Uh, that, that's really uh, what is exciting about this. Um, there's a lot of great visual storytelling in the suits themselves. Uh, I'm not going to identify the villain faction, other than t- to say that there is a villain faction... Um, that, well, I'm going to slightly identify them. Metsubo Jinrai is this terrorist network um, that works to uh, cause terror um, by uh, getting Humagear to rampage and go wild. And they uh, have uh, two riders whose suits are similar to one another. Uh, they have a very specific aesthetic uh, that kind of like how they force Humagear to go on rampages and uh, go rogue, go bad. Uh, their suits are reflective of that idea that they are forcing the uh, like animal powers or the animal suits to activate on them. And they feel very techy, very armory. Uh, they do remind me a lot of the X8 armor, actually, um, which is, I think, a good thing in some ways. Uh, but it feels very much like... Uh, they it feels very unnatural the armor feels like it's all being forced versus uh zero ones which uh has a very minimalistic design uh it feels uh the fact that zero ones main uh hopper armor um moves around on his body to allow the other armors to the other animal armors to come on and they like coexist and work with each other uh is interesting um so i think that's a very interesting distinction his is sleek and smooth and it seems like everything's in cooperation with each other. It, it kind of feels harmonious to look at him, and you can feel uh, a disharmony looking at the uh, Metsubo Jinrai writers. Um, yeah, I, I would say the aesthetic sense that they put across is misharmony or disharmony, and there's like a jagged, uh, harsh look to it, whereas he's more soft and rounded. Uh, yeah, interesting. I didn't even. That distinction just became more clear to me um and then the uh amos riders uh their suits look very much like you know they still have the animal theme going on because it's all animals and technology i guess is the the look for the riders um they look like they're an animal and a human gear combined together uh, like an exoskeleton of a humagear or something. Just all the whiteness on them uh, and kind of the clunkiness uh, does feel very reminiscent of the humagear. And uh, I believe the technology was developed uh, in sync uh, with Hedon Intelligence or there's a common group who works with them. Because there's a lot of allusions to things 
throughout the show. So, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, depth and nuance are, are part of the spoilers here. Um, there's in the second or third episode, there's a tour bus going and it's showing like 20 companies that tried to build a, uh, like a mega city, I believe. Um, and there's one called Zaya, which is the name of the satellite that they use. Um, and it's a big one. <laughs> And uh, or maybe it's Zia, or maybe it's both. Maybe they're Zia and Zia. I can't remember. Uh, but along with Heden, they're a, a big, big company. And um, there's a guy who uh, is kind of lurking in the shadows. Who we see um, Yaiba get her lightning hornet. I wanted to call it a disc um, information thing, progress key, progress key from. And uh, he seems to be at a whole separate company. Uh, which I believe may be associated. Anyway, I just don't think Heaton developed the human gear completely on their own. And in uh, kind of in Aruto's office, we see kind of different human gear bodies. And I don't know, just the, the stark white uh, ness of a lot of their design uh, mixed with the fact that the uh, Ames Riders are half white. It makes me feel like their suits are definitely uh, human gear inspired or. Um, they use Humagear technology to, uh, you know, merge with something else in order to form their suits. And that's very interesting. That seems to be telling a story, just like um, the story being told with the uh, jaggedness and the disharmony of the, uh, the Metsubo Jinrai writers. I want to get even more specific and talk about each of the uh, main three human writers. And... Uh, just get into to them uh, because I, I talked about depth and nuance, and that's something Takahashi Yuya, who was the head writer of Kamen Rider X8, who I think he wrote every single episode of that show and the movie, or movies. Uh, yeah, man, and those uh, those after anyway, oh, <laughs> those after the series movies were pretty interesting. Anyway, um, so Yuya uh, in X8, he presented us with uh, you know four main writers who were all struggling with the question of how. Does humanity deal with the bugsters, and uh, how do these doctors specifically, um, you know, treat their patients, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And uh, Aruto, Yaiba Yua, and Isamu Fua are in in X. Uh, sorry, in zero one, are uh, going through something similar. We are presented a world where these human gear exist. They're these amazing artificial intelligence. They're very useful to people's lives, but they can also go rogue. And they uh, did go rogue. Twelve years ago, there was an incident in Daybreak Town where uh, they rampaged and many people's lives were lost. Um, but ultimately, uh, they can be controlled. They can be destroyed. They can be uh, backed up, rebooted, reconfigured, um, you know, updated. My wife just lost her, or just broke her phone. Uh, she got a new one, and then all the data was backed up within a couple hours, or, you know, back on the phone like it was before, even like her app placement where it was. Uh, and that was amazing to see. And the human gear are similar. Um, and they're regarded by these three main writers, uh, Aruto, Isamu, and uh, Yua, in different ways. And it's nice to see that balance. Uh, and I'll go ahead and kind of delve into each of them and what they see in the human gear. Aruto Hedon is the grandson of the founder of Hedon Intelligence. And he thinks that human gear are great. He specifically says multiple times in the show that they are a manifestation of humanity's dreams and that they will help humans to reach their dreams, their full potential, that kind of thing. He's very positive about them. He's had so many positive interactions with them. He treats them as humans and he treats them as good people. Every time one of them is destroyed or harmed, um, he feels it in his heart. Uh, it hurts him and he wants to help them. And uh, he, uh, I would say he's a dreamer. He wants to be a comedian. Um, he's putting that aside to uh, be zero one one and be the CEO of Hidden Intelligence, which that's a, kind of a silly conceit, um, but whatever. And uh, He's doing it because he sees harm happening and he wants to stop it. And he wants to rescue the human gear themselves if he can. And definitely the people from uh, being hurt by human gears, you know, regular humans being hurt by human gears. And he also, I think, wants to rescue the dream uh, and the potential of what human gears living in harmony with humanity and helping them can be. 
Isamu Fuwa, uh, who becomes, uh, who's an Amos writer, he becomes Commander Vulcan. Uh, he is representative of uh, the victims of the human gear, the, uh, the fallout, so to speak, of what this uh, ambitious technology can bring. Uh, he was there uh, 12 years ago in Daybreak Town when the human gear went rogue and when uh, the city was destroyed. Um, and I mean, like, a nuclear bomb blew it up, destroyed. I don't know how he was evacuated and survived or whatever, but uh, he was, and that's interesting. Um, but uh, anyway, he wants to destroy all human gear. He thinks that they are, uh, basically, that they tend towards... <laughs> I think he thinks that every human gear that doesn't rampage isn't the exception, not the rule. And... He wants to protect other people from being hurt like he was by the human gear. And that leads him to hate them and want to destroy them. Now, uh, he's challenged uh, because this is a story. <laughs> it's a well-written story. And there are things that cause him to... That, ch that challenge his, his mindset. That cause him to change how he perceives the human gears and uh, episode... Uh, nine uh, really does a good job of that and um, I hope it's the middle of a character arc for him and not the end of a character arc because there's a lot more they could do with him but uh, there is also uh, Yaiba who needs to be dealt with um, and uh, you know Aruto of course because he, he can grow some more and he was challenged a little bit in episode nine too or eight and nine perhaps about what uh, you know how Humagir can continue to be humanity's dream um, but anyway getting back to Isamu uh, he's got a really interesting energy. Uh, a lot of people like, uh, seem to like his edginess more than I do. Um, I, there's a, a goofy, uh, aspect to him that I don't really like, but that I appreciate because I feel like it should be there and that no character should be that serious all the time. Um, but he's interesting. Uh, he's interesting to watch and, um, I don't know. He feels <laughs> a little bit like a character. Uh, to me, whereas Aruto feels a little more fleshed out and like uh, somebody, uh, well, a little, he, he feels like a, a, a more well-constructed character, whereas Fu feels a little flat, um, but I think uh, the uh, empathy that you have for him, based on seeing what happened to him and what he went through, um, helps you to forgive that a little bit, and uh, it definitely puts me in the mindset of accepting why he would uh, think that all human gear need to be wiped out ultimately. Um, and it's an interesting story to watch. And like I said, it adds uh, some nuance uh, to the idea overall. And the way his story is handled specifically is nuanced. And I can understand why he would think the things he thinks. Yaiba, Yaiba, Yaiba Yua. What am I going to say about Yaiba Yua? Uh, she's the pragmatist. She, she sees human gear as tools um <laughs> she sees them as tools she sees them as having utility and she's going to utilize that utility when it suits her and um she just wants to get things done and use the best tool for every job and uh this is kind of a, a bigger spoiler that goes so far as to uh she is willing to abduct a Magir, which is a rampaging human gear, and uh, manipulate it herself. Uh, I don't know if she's doing research on it. She's like a, a scientist. Uh, she helps develop some of the AIMS weaponry, although I'm telling you, Lightning Hornet was built by somebody else or designed by somebody else and given to her, so I don't really understand. Uh, she's a wild card. Um, she's a wild card. Uh, you know, I... I, <laughs> I um, in my notes that I have for this, my prompts, uh, I have that Aruto is the dreamer and he rescues, that um, Fuwa is the victim and he slays, and that Yaiba is the pragmatist and she manipulates. And uh, I hope I'm not going to catch any flack for that, but if you look at her actions in the show, which she happens to be a woman who manipulates, uh, she's manipulating people, uh, which is fine. Uh, I think women should be allowed to be bad too. Uh, and they should also be given prominent roles in these shows. And I'm thankful that we have uh, the first ever female writer. Um, now, if that's not woke enough to get you watching, uh, then um, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, 
she's very interesting because there are these deeper things going on behind the scenes in the background of the show that we don't quite understand, but we know that she's involved with them somehow. And, uh, gosh, it really is interesting to see her role play out because, uh, well, she has, like, the three of them, Yaiba, Uwa, and Aruto have arcs that, like, uh, not come to a head, but they're definitely developed and twisted on, uh, in episode eight and nine, um, she has a very interesting conversation with Izu, who I haven't talked about, who is the uh, Humagir assistant to the CEO of Hidden Intelligence, who happens to be Aruto now, but it was previously his grandfather uh, up until the time that he died, which was not too long ago in the show. And it's very interesting because uh, Yaiba, Yua, and Izu have a conversation, and in that conversation, uh, Yaiba shows a lot of humanity, and uh, I want to say Izu does too, and uh, it's a very interesting conversation between the two of them, because Yaiba had almost presented herself uh, around Fuwa and Aruto as being a little mechanical, being a little robotic, and Aruto even remarks to her in episode 9 that uh, he's surprised how uh, she doesn't have it together, because she always does, and he's... Um, really surprised by that and he almost says something like oh so you are human after all and I think that's very interesting um I think it has a lot to say about uh perhaps women in the workplace and how they have to set aside um certain aspects of themselves in order to excel but then again uh you know so do I at work um so I don't know it's pretty interesting stuff um but like I said uh she seems to be manipulating things in the background uh, she does seem to be doing good, and she might be, as a pragmatist, manipulating things for the, the you know, the greater good, for uh, the betterment of all, and uh, to protect the most lives, and maybe you do that by grabbing a Magir and, uh, you know, doing as much, you know, hacking it and doing as much research as you can so you can, I don't know, develop a antivirus or a patch or something so that Metsubo Jinrai can't put their virus into uh, human gear and cause them to go rogue. I don't know. It's very interesting. It all is very interesting. Probably should have included this earlier. The way Metsubo Jinrai gets their, uh, gets Humagear to Rampage is really sinister. Uh, one of them comes up to them, puts a, a belt type thing on them, and forces them to, uh, it implants a virus in them, and it does terrible looking things to their bodies. They shed their human looking face. Um, and skin and whatnot, they become, you know, these, uh, intimidating looking androids with scary skull faces, red eyes and stuff. And then, uh, beyond that, uh, they get even more monstrous, uh, and then they attack. And then they have the ability to turn other human gear that are around them, uh, rogue by, uh, injecting them with a, let's say like a sample of their virus. But, uh, while those, uh, ones that get the belt slapped on them are, um, they get like a very specific theme, whether it be a bat or a frog or whatever. Uh, the others just uh, get like an armored face and, and some weapons that kind of pop out of nowhere. Uh, and then, you know, they go rogue and attack. And that's very interesting. And uh, you really do have a lot of empathy for the human gear because they're just, they feel like just another type of human or type of person. And they're being uh, used, victimized. You know, they're, uh, <laughs> they have dreams of having certain type of life. Uh, they uh, go along with the flow and they follow their programming uh, but have a little bit more than that and they are victims too and when they are uh, victimized by Metsubo Jinrai um, they're taken over and turned against you know people that they liked that they worked with um, and uh, it's just it's very interesting how it all works and uh, like I said the um, the threat posed by Metsubo Jinrai is very uh, interesting. Um, you know, their goal supposedly is to wipe out all humanity, and they're using the tools that humanity has created in order to do that. And uh, it's very unclear why. Although episode nine, I think, is it nine, or eight and nine, clarifies something. Um, but beyond Metsubo Jinrai, uh, because there is a lot to talk about with them, but it's also a little bit unknown. Uh, there is another faction to concern yourself with, and you know, actually, there is a. An interesting turn at one point where um, Jin, uh, the hooded member of Metsubo Jinrai, uh, kind of has empathy with uh, Magir, who is trying to resist the reprogramming. And uh, we don't really get to see 
that go anywhere yet, and I'm hoping that comes back because uh, it seemed like he was wavering a little, but then Hirobi, the other Metsubo Jinrai member, uh, kind of pulled him back from that, and uh, gosh, that was really interesting. I made an allusion earlier to other companies uh, that could come into play later, maybe like this guy who made Lightning Hornet works for one, uh, but within Hedon Intelligence also, there's a guy who's vice president who was hoping to become president. He, um, like Aruto, who has Izu, has a assistant Humagear, and she's in red, uh, which when the Humagear go bad, they turn red, um, or, you know, aspects of them turn red. So it's interesting that she kind of echoes that, uh, and Izu's the nice, you know, blues and greens, uh, the softer colors. Well, she's, you know, green like... Uh, Aruto, <laughs> like Kamen Rider Zero One, uh, and green and red are great, you know, complementary colors, they contrast each other so sharply, um, that I wonder if there's also going to be another element later on in the show that develops from within Hedon Intelligence to uh, oppose Aruto and his plans, and, or, or, perhaps, um, there's something more sinister within uh, Hedon uh, that will pop up, and uh, the possibilities of that uh, are interesting to me. And I really wonder how it will develop. And uh, I don't know. The show's pretty fantastic because uh, there are all these different layers built into it. And there's all this nuance. And there's a lot of story being told in how things are presented, which is why I think it's important to point out that this assistant um, looks so different, looks like a you know evil version, so to speak, of Izu. And uh, I, something interesting I noticed about to, her, too, is that she wears gloves and Izu doesn't. And Izu's hands are always up presented. And you can see them. She gives things to Aruto. Um, and I just wonder what it might mean that this uh, other high-level uh, assistant, uh, Humagear, uh, is in different colors. She wears gloves instead of having, you know, freely exp exposed hands and stuff, such. Uh, like, what could that mean? Uh, I don't know, but it fascinates me. There's a lot of good stuff going on in this show. And uh, I think I've made a pretty good case uh, as to why you should be watching Kamen Rider Zero One if you're not. And uh, if I convince you to watch it, let me know in the comments. And if I didn't do a very good job, let me know what you think uh, also in the comments and we can hash it out. Check out mjmunoz.com for more of my work. I'm currently reviewing Spider-Man comics and writing original fiction you can find there. I'm an aspiring author who will gladly accept your financial support through coffee. Or you can buy merch from my Redbubble store. MJ Loves Toku can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and mjmunoz.com slash mjlt, where you can find links to my Ultraman show, Going Ultra, and my comic review channel, uh, Swinging Through Comics. Relevant links are in the show notes. If you had a good time, like and share this. Subscribe and ring that bell to keep up with my weekly coverage of Zero One. And remember, you don't have to shout Henshin to be a hero.